Hello and welcome to Brooklyn Community Board 14's Lunch and Learn series. My name is Joanne Brown, Chair of Community Board 14, and I will be your host. Today is part four in our six part series in the Lunch and Learn series, where we bring you experts to facilitate a discussion about urban planning, public space, housing development, land use, and the built environment. You can find parts one, two, and three on the CB14 YouTube channel. Previous presentations were from the New York City Department of Planning, Citizens Housing and Planning Council, New York City Housing Preservation and Development. Today we are joined by the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development. ANHD is a member organization of community groups across New York City who use research, advocacy, and grassroots organizing to support the members in their work to build equity and justice in their neighborhoods and citywide. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce and welcome Christopher Walters from ANHD. Great, thanks, Joanne. Um, I will just share my uh, presentation here. Great, so thank you and, um, and thanks for that introduction. Um, Yes, yeah, so my name is Chris Walters. I'm the land use policy coordinator at the Association for Neighborhood and Neighborhood and Housing Development, um, ANHD. Um, and as Joanne said, we're a nonprofit organization. Our mission is to build community power to win affordable housing and thriving equitable neighborhoods for all New Yorkers. Um, and part of our work is on land use justice. So uh, recognizing that New York City's land use and zoning regulations are key levers in the development and preservation of our city's communities. And without proper representation from or the inclusion of low and moderate income New Yorkers, people of color, immigrants, and other marginalized populations, the city ends up making decisions on land use that exacerbate inequality by privileging capital over community. Um, and this is a stance that's largely come out of our work providing technical assistance to our members around uh, the de Blasio neighborhood rezonings and upzonings. So what I'd like to talk about today is sort of bigger picture, hopefully building on um, on the uh, sessions that you had before, um, talking about how our current planning system works and where we see its limitations as we start to envision what a more just system would look like. Um, and as the subtitle here sort of suggests, a, a just system that both empowers communities, but empowers them to advance equitable plans. I'm sorry, give me one second here. So again, first, just sort of some some bigger picture um, framing. Um, you know, we'll be talking mostly about land use, especially as it pertains to affordable housing and and community engagement. But just sort of bigger picture around planning, um, which is more than just land use and zoning. Um, so what is planning? I mean, planning at its simplest is a process that provides a vision um, for a community. And again, this includes land use. This includes zoning, but it's more than that. It is infrastructure its investments, its policies. And ideally, it's putting all of these together with the goal of furthering the welfare of community members by creating convenient, equitable, healthful, efficient, and attractive environments. Um, so again, in this way, planning is community building. So why does planning matter? Um, well, planning determines many of the conditions that structure our lives. I, I think, in fact, it's it's such a part of what our neighborhoods look and feel like, that it's easy to ignore, or easy to miss almost the role that planning plays. Um, but this can mean things from, you know, whether folks have access to healthy food, um, to affordable housing, to uh, hospitals and health care, to whether our after school programs are funded, our community centers, our parks. And then planning can be a process of community building, but it can also be a process of community destruction. And this is why it's so essential that local residents participate in planning processes. And this is especially true given the influence of private interests, which often see our communities as potential sources of profit, places to sort of extract value from rather than to help build community. Again, at the same time, there's always this tension to make sure that what a community's vision is, is one that's equitable and inclusionary. So making sure that as we're empowering communities, it's not to put forward an exclusionary vision. And then lastly, planning determines the future. So 
the built the built environment development infrastructure uh, these are things that are going to be around for a long time and it means that when we make our planning decisions today we need to be thinking many generations in the future so just very quickly um, and we'll touch on this more but uh, who plans, you know, both in the city, county, regional level. So, again, it's local residents. Uh, I think this is something that we always seek to be strengthening. I think that right now, most often local residents participate in are sort of forced to participate in a more reactive fashion. So, responding to proposals from others rather than putting forward their own proactive visions. Um, it's professional planners, um, folks who work for the city, folks who work for consultants, work for nonprofits. It's our elected leaders, it's politicians who ultimately have decision making power over our planning processes. That's certainly true for land use and zoning. And then again, it's private interests and in particular uh, real estate developers who have a lot of influence over the planning processes. So, uh, again, planning is about more than land use, more than zoning, but we'll focus today mostly on. On land use and zoning and how it relates to affordable housing to community input. Um, I know you, I know DCP visited earlier, um, so we won't go deep into zoning, but just sort of a, a quick refresher. This is actually the preamble, the introduction to the zoning resolution. So, um, what is zoning? Um, zoning is about guiding future development. And at its simplest, it's about regulating the height and bulk of buildings. So, how tall something can be, how big something can be. Regulating the area around that building, how much open space is required, and the density of population, how many people essentially can live in those buildings, how many of those big buildings or small buildings can be next to each other. And then regulating and restricting the locations of trades and industries. So what uses can happen in those buildings and where are those buildings with different uses located? And then essentially dividing the entire city into districts that lay out all these rules. So, in theory, it, it, it seems sort of simple, um, but it has grown into a, a vast body of law. This graphic here is actually um, the growth of the zoning resolution itself. So, um, the first zoning resolution in New York and in the country was in 1916. Uh, it has grown to over 3,000 pages today, including appendices. So zoning guides uh, development and guides all future development. It doesn't dictate what has been built in a neighborhood already, but it lays out the rules for anything that's going to be built moving forward. And so one of the first questions that's asked when a development is proposed is does it match the existing zoning, the current zoning? If it does match the current zoning, it is as of right. There's no approval needed beyond building permits and things of those nature. There's very little leverage or opportunity for community input or leverage to to change uh, what the proposal is. Uh, that includes then for affordable housing. You know, if the, if the developer does not intend to build affordable housing, uh, there are very few ways, essentially no ways to require that for as of right uh, development in terms of in terms of zoning. Um, and since 2010, about 80% of new housing in New York City has been built as of right. So this is the majority of development that we see in the city. Now, if a development proposes to, to change the zoning rules, if the, a development is looking to build uh, larger than is allowed today or to bring in uh, more uses than are allowed, then a rezoning is required. Um, and this would go through ULERP, the Uniform Land Use Review Procedure. And since 2010, 20% of new housing uh, in the city has been built following a site-specific rezoning. So this is either a developer or the city on a specific parcel or uh, group of parcels looking to change the zoning. About half of these proposals uh, came through private developers and about half have been advanced by the city. And then sort of one further caveat, 80% um, of new housing has been built as of right, but since 2010, 30% of new housing, um, so almost half of that has been built as of right following a neighborhood rezoning. And this sort of starts to get into the, the importance of, of neighborhood rezonings and why it's so important uh, to get them right, to make sure they're applied in the right neighborhood towards the right ends um, and with the right intentions. The idea of a neighborhood rezoning, um, as, you, as you likely know already, 
is to change the zoning rules across a wide swath of a neighborhood. Um, the intention can be to increase density overall. Some of the sort of best known rezonings, the Williamsburg waterfront, Long Island City, downtown Brooklyn, have been up zonings of that nature. Um, some of them can be down zonings as well. And, and actually under Bloomberg, a lot of the city, especially the outer borough was down zoned. So this was to decrease development potential. Um, in some cases, making it harder to build multifamily in lower density uh, neighborhoods. And then often what you find with neighborhood rezonings is, is a mix. Up zonings along certain corridors and down zonings, a decrease in density uh, in other areas. And again, so 30% of housing that's been built as of right has been built following a neighborhood rezoning. So following the new rules that were put in place once that neighborhood rezoning was approved. So as I started to touch on, there's different types of rezonings. Um, up zonings are what tend to draw the most attention um, and an upzoning, as I began to say, is an increase in density. Um, I won't get into floor area ratio. I imagine that DCP covered that with you. Um, and, I, and I should say in general, if folks have sort of clarifying questions. I'm, I'm happy to answer as you go. Otherwise, I imagine we'll do some, some discussion after. Um, but an upzoning is where you are increasing uh, the allowed density in a neighborhood. Essentially, all site rezonings, so that 20% of development that follows site specific rezonings, either developers or the city. Almost all of those are up zonings. Again, developer or the city looking to build something bigger than is currently allowed today. Um, and as I said, neighborhood rezonings follow a more varied pattern up zonings, down zonings, and what you might call sort of a hybrid rezoning. Um, under de Blasio, almost all uh, neighborhood rezonings um, have been up zonings, or the intention of them has been to increase density in the neighborhoods in which they've been mapped. So what I wanted to look at here was housing production and affordable housing production in the city. Um, and this starts to get at why we care about where uh, rezonings are taking place, how rezonings are being used and planning is being used as one tool to create affordable housing. Um, so what you see on the left here, this map is all housing units completed uh, from 2010 to 2018. And on the left, affordable units completed 2014 to 2020. Um, and so one thing that you see is that there has not been an equal or equitable distribution of new housing throughout the city. Um, most density has been concentrated uh, in a few neighborhoods, um, parts of Brooklyn, especially uh, Western Queens and parts of Manhattan. The neighborhoods that have seen the, the largest growth have been those that were up zoned under Bloomberg. So again, Long Island City, downtown Brooklyn, uh, Williamsburg. All the lighter areas, again, especially towards the outer boroughs, is where there's been very little new housing production. And this sort of disparity, this, this inequity of um, units that have been, have been completed is even more apparent when you look at, at affordable units. Um, so here you see they've really been concentrated um, in, in certain neighborhoods. Again, this sort of swath of northern down into central Brooklyn, uh, parts of northern Manhattan into the Bronx, and some of the neighborhoods that saw rezonings under Bloomberg. But again, all these lighter areas are places where uh, very little to no affordable housing has been produced. And we can take a, a, a look at CB14 um, to see what has been built um, since 2014. So in terms of new units in total, close to 2,000 new units of total housing have been completed um, in the community district uh, as of June of last year. Um, that ranks, that ranks your district about 21st out of 59 community districts. So a bit ahead of the median in terms of, um, in terms of development. About 250 of those were affordable units. So about 13% uh, of the total were affordable. 
that puts you right, right about smack in the middle. I think that puts you about 27th of the 59 community districts. But what's interesting is when you look at AMI breakdown. So um, this is the area median income breakdown of affordable housing. This is essentially laying out the, the types of uh, families, the types of income ranges that are being served by the affordable housing. Um, and a majority of the affordable housing in CB14 has been middle income units. Um, so these are units that serve families making up to, and actually at this point now, a little bit over $150,000 a year for a family of three. All but one development uh, has provided, affordable development has provided almost exclusively middle income units in the district. Um, there is one 100% affordable building which has provided uh, all the extremely low income units um, that you see here. So again, you know, why do we, why does this matter? You know, why do we care where affordable housing is being produced? Um, I think we all know the, the, the vast inequity in the city. Um, I think there's a lot of sort of different graphics you can choose to show this. Um, I'm pulling here a recent analysis that ANHD did uh, on eviction filing rates um, during COVID. So this map on the left, uh, the darker the color, the darker the red, uh, the more evictions uh, have been filed um, since the pandemic began. Um, in the middle, you see these same neighborhood tabulation areas by their percent of residents of color. And then on the right, those same ones by their death rate from COVID. So I think this serves as a, a stark example of the, um, the way that the impacts of, uh, of COVID um, and of our unequal system hit some communities uh, harder than others, um, and why you know one reason among many why we need to be pushing for a planning system that is increasing equity, that is trying to push more equitable outcomes. Excuse me. Now, the, the city's response to this, or or one of their responses to how they will address inequity is to say, we will rezone in lower income neighborhoods to create more affordable housing. And, and we will do that by setting aside a certain portion of housing as mandatory inclusionary housing. The issue with this, with the way the city has chosen to apply this, and you can see in this map, um, what this map shows, the areas in orange are areas that are um, at high risk of displacement uh, based on metrics like income, uh, overcrowding, rent burden, and things of that nature. Um, and when the city has essentially chosen to apply their tool of mandatory inclusionary housing, again, I imagine you guys have covered this before, but a, a, a tool that requires in neighborhoods that have been upzoned or in developments that have been upzoned, a certain percentage of the units has to be set aside as affordable. Um, I think it's a good tool in theory. I think what's important is where it's applied. Um, and is it applied as a way of achieving affordable housing in places where there, where it's not being created today um, and in places where it's not going to further displacement risk by bringing in more market rate housing than affordable housing? I think, unfortunately, and this is what we've heard from every community that's been rezoned by the city thus far, um, the city has chosen the wrong approach. They have chosen to apply MIH through these blanket up zonings in these communities of color um, that face significant displacement risk and that these up zonings may help exacerbate. And I think the, the next graphic makes this a, a little more clear. Um, in looking at where MIH has been mapped and what the median household income is in those, uh, in those neighborhoods. Um, so MIH serves um, AMI levels of about 60%. It sometimes can get down to 40, it sometimes can go to 80 or even higher. Um, the concern in most of the neighborhoods that the city has chosen to apply MIH is that even the mandatory inclusionary housing 
is out of reach for the median uh, household in the neighborhood um, to say nothing of of the market rate. When you look at where MIH has been mapped as part of private rezonings, um, it, it's a little better. You see that there are more neighborhoods um, that are moderate income, um, getting close to higher income, um, but still primarily in extremely low, very low, um, or low income neighborhoods. So, again, I was hoping to sort of lay the, um, you know, lay the ground for, for why we care about um, where rezonings take place um, to consider who gets to decide on those rezonings um, and how the community gets to, uh, gets to have a say. Um, so, again, the current zoning resolution was written in 1961, but it's constantly being changed through zoning text and map amendments. Um, so who gets to do that? Um, the city does that, as we know, and they do that through uh, either neighborhood rezonings or through text amendments like mandatory inclusionary housing, changing the, the, the rules of the zoning text. But officially, any resident or group can apply for changes in the zoning resolution. And as we said, since 2010, about half of site-specific rezonings have come through proposals from private developers. Um, now, it's difficult to bring these proposals through Euler. Um, it takes money, it takes technical capacity that these developers have. They're able to uh, spend the time and money to, to go through the Euler process. And the Department of City Planning will work with them to craft a proposal that fits a public purpose so they can justify a zoning change. So always with these private rezonings, as with the public rezoning, a developer has to have a reason beyond, I want to bigger, build a bigger building or, or, or I want to make more money. Um, they have to show a public purpose that will be served um, uh, to allow this rezoning to go through. Um, that's where mandatory inclusionary housing can play a role in bringing in affordable housing. But again, that's where it matters what types of neighborhoods these projects are being proposed in. So, what typically happens when, um, when a community proposes a comprehensive plan is that it is ignored or co-opted. And by comprehensive plan here, I mean um, something akin to a neighborhood rezoning for their community. Um, so, we've worked in a few different neighborhoods in, in Bushwick and in the Two Bridges neighborhood in Manhattan um, through multi-year processes um, to create neighborhood plans, plans that envisioned how growth should happen in the neighborhood in a way that would balance displacement concerns with the need for new affordable housing, with the need for new density um, in general. Um, and unfortunately, what we find in essentially almost all situations is that where a community has put a plan forward, um, it is ignored or co-opted by the city. Uh, so, again, the city has the ability to, to change the zoning resolution to, um, to, to, to plan for a neighborhood or for the larger city. Private developers have a role there, but the community itself is left out. And so, what happens is that the community is sort of left in a role of having to respond to the city and to uh, private developers proposals. Um, as I'm sure you know, um, community boards and borough presidents weigh in on these Euler proposals with a non-binding vote. And then the city planning commission and the city council uh, give their approval. Uh, if yes, a zoning proposal becomes the new rule. If yes, with modifications, an amended version of the zoning proposal or if no, existing zoning stays unchanged. So again, what this means sort of in summary is that uh, community groups are, are left out of the equation here. 
that ULURP is an expensive, time-consuming, technically challenging process that requires sustained resources, resources that groups often do not have. Um, community groups, when they do create plans, and we'll bring them to the city to say, will you help us guide this through? Um, they are typically rejected. Or in the case of some 197A plans, which, which we can talk about more, but which is a whole process that community boards can go through, um, they will often then be co-opted by the city. The city will say, we are now putting forward our rezoning that advances the goals of the 197A plan, um, but with significant daylight between the community's vision and, and what the city has proposed. Um, on the flip side, as we've said, the city will work with private developers um, who overwhelmingly get the green light to initiate the process. And what this then tends to mean is that where there's conflict between a proposal, again, from the city or developer and the community's priorities, the community is typically left to either accept projects they don't like in exchange for needed public benefits or to say no outright to be accused of being anti-development or against change. And so these are just sort of some of the questions um, that, that we are asking, that we're sort of asking our members that I would ask you all to consider as well um, in terms of what a just system would look like. Um, so what should be the process by which developers get approval from community members before they change the zoning in a neighborhood? Um, who should be able to decide whether or not a rezoning proposal gets approved? Uh, and then sort of broader, and again, bringing in some of the equity issues we talked about, um, what principles should our planning system be grounded in? And then to the CB specifically, what resources would you um, need uh, to participate more deeply in city planning processes? And I'll end it there and, and um, welcome questions or, or, um, or thoughts. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. That was really such an amazing presentation that, uh, and I, I really appreciate, you know, that you um, brought the community um, district into your presentation so we can get a look at what it looks like um, for our affordable housing situation. I have a question from the chat. Um, what happens to development potential when you overlay environmental restrictions, um, including swamps and floodplains? Um, has this component been incorporated into the planning process? In other words, the gestalt land versus usable land. Mm -hmm. Let me know if you need me to read it again. It's also in the chat. Yeah, I'll look at it in the chat because it helps to um, what happens to development potential when you overlay environmental restrictions, floodplains. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if I understand you um, right, is that is that one uh, is that one consideration that dictates um, zoning designations that dictates um, how much density uh, is allowed um, in a neighborhood. Um, and, and let me know in the chatter over the mic if I, if I have that wrong. Um, um, but yes, that is a consideration for, um, that is a consideration for zoning. Um, it's one that I would frankly say is, um, is unequally applied. Um, the waterfront is, for example, is treated differently um, in in different neighborhoods. So um, most of Staten Island, for example, is um, is what's called a, a lower um, density growth management area, um, and that's one partly around um, environmental preservation, um, but I think partly around other issues that limits most of the island in terms of how much density um, uh, can be um, can be taken on. Um, but that's not something you see along the waterfront um, in higher market uh, neighborhoods um, that also experience, you know, that are also at flood risk or that are also um, neighborhoods where the conversation maybe should be more around 
what is sustainable development look like um, on the waterfront um, beyond, let's say, lobbies that can have floodwaters go through them or, you know, things being um, mechanicals being lifted off of um, off of the ground floor. Um, does that answer your question, though? Does that does that make sense? Yeah, I see. Yes. Um, they. Not not as much as the zoning map sh uh, shows essentially would be my so that's not the reason um, that there are um, so many lower density areas when you um, when you look on the zoning map. Um, and again, there are places where that is um, where that is the case. Um, the city recently did a rezoning of um, a broad channel um, that was uh, in Jamaica Bay um, that was around decreasing density in part because of flood risks. But um, it's not the only reason, and I would say it's again sort of inequitably applied. Just for context, uh, the in the chat. Um, Chris's response that you just heard uh, the chat, the zoning maps show large areas of seemingly underdevelopment, uh, but are those unsustainable? And that was Chris's response and context. Um, I have a question from Glenn Wallen. Go ahead. Hi, thank you very much for uh, a very comprehensive uh, presentation. I do appreciate it, uh, but I would like to point out that the way you presented it makes it seem that if a community group such as ours wanted to make some zoning change, I don't believe that's the case because about 15 years ago, a six story building was going up within sight of my backyard. So I decided I wanted to do something about it. And I looked at the zoning map and realized that the west side of Stratford Road, where my house is located was in an R6 zoning. So I started a whole process of down zoning the area. And with a great deal of help from Richard Barak, a whole series of tutorials, because it's an incredibly complex process, uh, and a lot of help from Alvin Burke, uh, getting the support of the community board, we were in fact able to get the whole, whole north. Um, it is doable. It's very difficult. It took me four and a half years, and clearly I needed help. Uh, and so thank you, Richard. Um, but I just want people to know that it is not hopeless. It's just a lot of work, a lot of effort, uh, but it can be done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Glenn, for that. Um... And 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 that is right, and and I don't mean to give um, the impression. I think that what we have, um, I think that what we have found, you know, in a lot of the neighborhoods um, that we've worked in, and some of this may be the difference between Bloomberg and DeBasio um, as well. Um, but is the um, the difficulty in, in these? Um, lower income communities of color that we work in of, of trying to advance these plans. Um, I think, especially when the city has their own ideas there. Um, so, um, that is, that is good to hear and a good reminder though, exactly that, um. That it's not hopeless, but that, um. I think what we're always trying to push is, um. Is making sure that the burden of new development. Is not falling uh, just on these these sort of more marginalized, perhaps less powerful, politically powerful communities, um, and you know that's something that we're trying to trying to change. We have a question from Steve Cohen. Go ahead, Steve. Thanks. Um, uh, Glenn answered part of my question, which was going to be about. Um, Com examples of community groups um, coming together and being successful. But I guess um, what I gathered from your presentation 
uh, you're focused more on upzoning to allow more affordable housing. So I'm curious if there have been successful instances of community groups uh, coming together to uh, provide for an upzoning for affordable housing, because I, at least from my exposure to the issue, a lot of local community groups usually will oppose upzoning because of fears of school overcrowding or changing character of the neighborhood or all those sorts of things. So I'm just wondering if there's circumstances in, when, in which it works, maybe for like a you know smaller area, maybe in more you know rental heavy neighborhoods, less less owner less homeowners or single family homes. So uh, just curious if you could speak about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, I think you're right, and I and I think that's what I was um, perhaps partly trying to get at in in, um, in my response to to Glenn is that um, I mean, essentially, no. To my knowledge, we have found it difficult when um, when a community is trying to put forward what they would say and what I would agree is a a sort of very thoughtful plan that tries to exactly balance these considerations um, in saying, um, where can we, um, you, you know, where can we, how can we achieve um, more affordable housing in our neighborhood um, in a way that we feel like um, does not increase displacement risk, um, does not, uh, you know, takes into account um, reasonable growth and, and equitable growth. Um, and again, I mentioned Bushwick because uh, to me, the Bushwick community plan was was a prime example of that. Um, it was one where the community was was not saying it, it was one where the community was saying we recognize that the status quo is, is not serving us. We're seeing a lot of gentrification. Um, we're seeing a lot of development that includes no affordable housing and there's or it includes affordable housing that's way out of reach for our community. And there's and there's nothing we can do about it. So let's try to harness growth in in a more equitable way, in a way that works for us. Um, and unfortunately, that that fell apart with the city um, around essentially how much growth they would take. And the, the city had their number um, that they uh, were opaque about, but also weren't um, willing to to come down from. Um, so I think that's why I sort of been trying to frame this, why I say it's this mix of um, of community empowerment um, and equity and, and trying to move forward into a system where um, where each community is laying out its vision um, for how you can have equitable growth. And also by doing that, then distributing it throughout the city so that no one is taking on more than they should and, and, and may reduce the pressures for, for every community um, in that regard. There's a question in the chat. Um, the question is, do you feel that any of the mayoral candidates have an agenda that addresses many of the issues you have highlighted? With the caveat, not asking for an official endorsement, just interested in knowing if you see anyone out there in city government doing something. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, it's interesting and actually you can, um, and I'll see if I can actually even drop the link in the chat. We 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 just yesterday put out um, um, put out sort of our our scorecard of um, of candidates um, in terms of affordable housing. Um, I, I think in the broader sense, it's interesting. You know, we see certainly an acknowledgement um, um, of the importance of affordable housing in the city um, from the candidates. I think we're still looking for sort of a, a bolder commitment to saying, um, you know, that we can really do something about this and that we can um, not just sort of goals, but outcomes. So in saying um, we can end uh, or significantly reduce um, rent burden among the neediest, we can end homelessness. Um, I think in terms of land use, um, you know, you're hearing from, from some candidates that, um, that more neighborhoods need to be on the table for um, for taking additional growth um, and for 
I should say really specifically for, for creating more affordable housing than, um, than they're doing now. Um, and then I think it's largely tools that are, um, that are outside of zoning, but um, increased subsidy, um, more community ownership. So things like community land trusts um, um, and, and tools of that nature. Um, and as I'm thinking of it, I'll try to also just drop in um, in the chat what I've just mentioned. We have a question from Florencia Changageda. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you for this presentation. Uh, actually, some of it was already answered because uh, I was just saying that I'm glad what happened with Glenn, but in many of the poorer neighborhoods, that's not the case at all. And there, you know, and that a lot of folks are even being displaced. So I just wanted to know what's being done for the new population of homelessness that's there. But as we can hear, the question was kind of sort of asked already. So that was uh, what I wanted to ask and what I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you for once here for. Um, for highlighting that, yeah, I, I think. Um, you know, I think, as I said, 1, right? I mean, we, we recognize that. Um, in terms of affordable housing land use is is 1 tool. Um, among many, um, so I think a lot of. What's being done is on again on the subsidy end or or, um, or vouchers. Um, but um, yes, I think you're right. And what we want to change in terms of planning is is empowering those communities that are um, that feel threatened by um, by rezonings that you know that really have seen them as um, as displacement inducing or or um, um, exacerbating, um, and find ways to empower them to um, to put forward their vision. Um, in a way that works for them hand in hand with every community doing the same. Um, so that again, we can sort of take the burden off of those communities and spread it out a, a bit more fairly. We have a question from district manager, Sean Campbell. Go ahead, Sean. Thank you. Um, I have 2 questions actually, if that's okay. 1, 1 is a, a sort of about fact and 1 is about process. Um. I used to have this statistic at my fingertips from, I think I took from uh, the Furman Center about how developable um, our community district is in terms of where we already were at at FAR or very close to FAR. I think a developable, a developable um, site is one that's under 50% of its allowable FAR. And my recollection is that we were pretty low in the, in the city in terms of having spaces to to build on. And I'm wondering if that is part of how a community or a borough or the city at large should look at where up zonings do make sense and where building without having to go through a zoning process does make sense. So that's that's my um, question about just getting information to make decisions on. And then as far as process goes, um, you, you, you mentioned community land trust as a way of building capacity. Um, and I wonder if there's other examples of like of building capacity through collaboration. Like I, I, I've heard tell of some nonprofit developers who join forces to build sort of co-ops so that they have the um, capacity to compete with private developers. And I think St. Nick's Alliance might be one of them or somewhere up there in Northern Brooklyn. So I wonder if there's more examples of that and if there are or examples of two or three or more community boards banding together to have a sort of united front vis-a-vis um, -vis land use issues that mm -hmm. pertain to their their areas. I know that some of them are doing that vis-a-vis -vis city agencies and mm -hmm. pushing back on agency policies, but I'm wondering if this is going on in land use. Sorry if that was a lot and thank you for whatever you wanted to pull out of there. Mm -hmm. No, of course. Um, yeah, and those are... Um, those are great questions. I think um, I think for community boards, I I don't know myself what um, in terms of sort of partnerships or things. Um, I think you know even series like these. I think it's great. Like I think that this is it's great that you all are considering um, 
um, these issues. And I think um, the idea of trying to build sort of a, a broader collaboration um, is a great one. Um, you know, community boards can and have been very involved in um, in trying to craft community plans. Um, again, either through 197A, which I think, frankly, no community board has has tried to do since something like 2011 because of the because of the the headwinds that it runs into. Um, but also stuff like the Bushwick Community Plan um, or the Chinatown Working Group Plan um, in Manhattan, um, of which the True Bridges neighborhood I mentioned is a part. Um, and then I think there's also other, um, you know, there's other ideas and, and legislation that are around um, sort of, as you said, trying to make it easier for um, nonprofit developers to um, to compete with with private developers. Um, so things like um, ensuring that any city owned land that's going to be developed um, goes to nonprofit 100% affordable development. Um, or that nonprofit uh, developers get a right of first refusal if, um, if, if something is, is being sold. Um, and again, I think with community land trust, there's been a, a growing um, interest in that um, um, throughout the city. We thank have you, a, thank you. We have a question in the chat, and this is a great question. What, what has been the effect of COVID on affordable development and how long lasting will it be? Yeah, that's a really, that's a very good, um, um, a very good question. Um, I don't have the most comprehensive answer, but my, um, my understanding is actually um, the, the city DCP recently put out sort of their, their housing snapshot. Um, and um, their findings were actually that that it's it's likely that affordable development. Um, I, I should say that during COVID, affordable development was not, those um, developments were not suspended. There was not a um, um, they were um, sorry that I'm struggling for the word, but they they could continue. They're, they were like considered essential, and and that development was allowed to continue. Um, so I know DCP was highlighting. That in the Bronx, for example, which tends to see a lot of affordable development, um, there wasn't a very big dip in housing construction there um, during COVID. Um, I think that where you would see it the most are um, affordable developments that rely on uh, private developers. So uh, essentially things being achieved through MIH or, or voluntary inclusionary housing. Um, where the developers, uh, either because of financing or because they had to pause um, where the project was delayed. Um, you know, on the flip side, what you've certainly seen is, um, is tenants in affordable developments as everywhere um, struggling to, to pay their rent. Um, and so I know we've seen, um, and I believe that Furman Center recently put something out as part of their um, state of the city's neighborhoods um, on, um, how rent rolls and affordable projects have been have been affected by COVID and, and how hard hit um, tenants have been there. Um, Greg Alvarez, you had a question ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and thank you again for the presentation today. Uh, very, very informative. Uh, I just had two quick questions. Uh, one, um, just talking about private uh, Rezones and obviously they they come our way on a regular basis. So when we as a community board sees you know this sort of application come before us and you know there's an MIH component or they're looking to do that, do you have any suggestions or recommendations of what you know how how a community board you know should be tackling those sorts of applications? You know, some you know to have that critical eye when they come in. Um, do you have any thoughts on that and, you know, and how a community board should, uh, sh should view these applications when they arrive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, um, that's a great question. Uh, I think, um, to me, sort of 1 of the 1 of the questions, um. To consider is 
what type of affordable housing development you're seeing otherwise, so sort of what you're seeing in your district um, absent MIH, sort of what, what percentage, what ratio um, of development that's taking place is affordable, um, and, and what, at what income level, sort of who is that, um, who is that serving? Um, and, and this is, I think, a, an, an approach, um, you know, that I would suggest sort of citywide is, um, is a proposed project bringing more affordable housing at, at a higher ratio is what I mean by that than, than exists, um, than exists today. Um, so to me, that will be one of sort of the central considerations. Um, and then, um, you know, I think gets into then the more sort of neighborhood specific, but, um, but where it is in the neighborhood, um, who it's accessible to, um, again, wh you know, in the neighborhood. Um, and then I think as, as always, you know, what, um, you know, what's so tricky with the, with these private rezonings is that the, it, it's the public purpose is made public, but the private value to be gained is not made public. So you never know what a, what a developer's bottom line is, you know, and, and what they stand. Um, so I think always worth pushing to get the most, you, you know, the most public value you, you can. Um, and again, to, to, to use that as leverage to the broader point of saying, um, this is why we need a community vision for how development should look and where it should go so that we're not doing this, uh, you know, bit by bit, piece by my piecemeal. Um, yeah, would be, would be my, my two cents. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, it, just, just one more question. I've sort of, we've sort of talked around a little bit, but what, what's your, you know, in looking at this, uh, mayor who's had 8 years and 1 of his. Biggest, you know, initiatives, you know, coming through was, you know, trying to get more affordable units built. What what do you think of that legacy and what, if anything, can we take from it moving forward? You know, and, and the new mayor, you know, whoever that might be can take forward to, to, to use the most successful techniques that that may have come out of all of this. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I, I think 1 of our main points and critiques of. Um, de Blasio ha has been the, the focus on, on numbers, sort of number of units over, um, over need and over, um, who's being served by those units. So, um, to me, that sort of focus, and not just to me, to, to A and HD and to, and to many, um, that focus on number, um, you know, 200,000 units built to preserve and 300,000 units, um, it, it then points the way towards policies that I think um, could actually lead to a, a net loss of housing. So it points the way to, um, you know, blank to up zonings in, in low income communities of color where, um, where the affordable housing is the guaranteed affordable housing is actually out of reach and you risk changing the market by bringing in this potential for all this new, um, all this new market rate um, or some of the sort of um, not strong preservation deals that the administration made. Um, so our point has always been, you know, focus on um, focus on need most. You know, if you've built um, middle income affordable housing, um, yes, you can count that towards your units, your unit count. Mm -hmm. But who is that really serving? Um, better to have fewer units, but have them targeted towards. Um, the most rent burdened, um, the most at risk of displacement, the most at risk of homelessness. And that then allows you to also target your, your land use, your rezoning approach um, in that same way. That's looking to sort of use MIH where it's going to bring the most value without displacement risk, focus on other tools for affordable housing um, um, in those neighborhoods where it, where it might cause more harm than, than good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, we, we just have a few more minutes and there's, um, there's 2 questions in the chat, but I, I wanted to round, you know, come back around, uh, about the position or. The role of the community board, um, in 
the process, particularly in um, in private site rezoning, um, you know, my the mentorship that I received on this community board was that we always answer in the affirmative, right? Because if we say no, we have no opportunity to add modif non-body modifications, <laughs> right? If we say yes, we can go ahead and we can offer 16 points that have come directly from the community. And I think you've given us a lot of ideas to say, okay, what should some of those, what should the framework look like? Uh, what are we looking for from those questions? Do you have any other, um, just anything else to say about the fact that while, while the public might say um, the community board approved this with modifications, it's, it wasn't, it's, from my from my education being on this board, it's more important for us to answer in the affirmative uh, than it is to just flatly say no and have <laughs> no input at all. You just say no, you yeah. say no. And, and so, sorry, Joanne, I'm, I, I might have just missed the. Um... So, I guess my question is: Do you think that? Do you think that our approach? Is um, is more effective to say yes with modifications rather than to just say we don't we don't uh, the community doesn't accept this so the, the community board is is also going to say no does that make sense yes yeah um, yeah I think that's a tricky um, I think that's right and and that's how um, I would say in my experience most community boards. Are going to say um, either yes or or no with modifications, um, and I think. Um, but I guess my point there is that it almost I almost feel like those serve the same role, you know. It's, and maybe you say no if you're trying to make a, a bit of a stronger point. Um, we don't like this, but we understand we still have to, um, you know, to stay in the game. We we say no, but here's how you could get there. Um, you know, I I think that. Um, you know, I guess I would say it then just, you know, de depends on how you have seen um, those modifications, um, what the response to those modifications generally is or um, or are, whatever the grammar should be for that. Um, um, yeah, is it something that CPC takes into consideration? Is it something that the um, council member or council members, um, you, you know, is modifying when, um, when it goes before um, when it goes before council, um, and right, I guess then the question of you know what is the most leverage, but if there's a way to um, you know if there's interest in this in, in the notion of how can we start laying out a more sort of proactive community um, community vision, um, is there a way to um, you know one thing you could do is is what are modifications that you're frequently making to private applications. And to start saying, you know, I know some community boards have created like a, a, um, a development sort of checklist, or this is what we think good development looks like in our community. And this is what we want any proposal that's coming before us. You know, we want, this is what we want to see. And, and it's almost like a checklist that you can give to a developer at their first meeting with the community board to say, you know, if you're going to be proposing or rezoning, know that these are, you know, this is what we're going to want to, um, you know, these are the types of things that we're going to want to see, and that can also sort of lay the groundwork for, for, you know, broader or more robust planning from there in terms of in terms of like what what the community's vision is. Okay, thank thanks for that input. <clears throat> um, if we can just try to get through these last two questions um, in the chat. Um, do you have an example of a time when the community was able to um, was not ignored in their? Uh, I'll just read the whole thing. Um, do you have an example of a time when the community, maybe to your surprise, was not ignored or co-opted? Um, yes, and I mean again, I'm glad, and and I see Glenn's response there. Um, um, yes, I would say. Um, it takes time and it takes resources and um, I would say, in my experience, it tends to. Break down most often along those lines, so um, groups that are communities and groups that are able to hire a consultant that are able to hire attorneys. Um, 
may be able to get their um, to get their plans through. Um, and um, I would say what we're trying to change is again what I see as sort of that that equity gap in terms of um, who's been able to do that and and who hasn't, and what are tools that we can in a, in a new approach that we can have to try to um, make that accessible to everybody. And, and then the last question, sorry for those who have put their hand up, we do have to start to wrap it up um, from the chat. How has the planning process met the challenge of diversity as propounded by folks like Jane Jacobs versus gentrification when development destroys the diversity that brought it into an area in the first place? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very, that's a very tricky um, question and I feel like that sort of gets at the heart of um, gets at the heart of planning and planning when it is ideally you know the sort of vision of planning that we have as being one that's used as a tool for for equity and community empowerment um, and so it's tricky because you know Jane Jane Jacobs in her era was pretty you know, essentially what she was saying was anti-planning, you know, and especially the planning of the day. But I think the question is, um, almost to flip what you're saying, the question is also what happens when a neighborhood um, like Jane Jacobs in the West Village be becomes I inaccessible to all but the, all but the wealthiest. Um, and so what's the role, but exactly as you're saying as well, you know, if development is just about sort of the, or if, if planning is just about sort of the, the real estate machine, then it becomes this tool for destruction um, as well. So I think it's about finding that, um, you know, that mix of top down and bottom up so that you have the equity sort of guiding from the top, but then the community vision, um, guiding from the bottom um, and then pulling in much more than just zoning and land use itself. But um, yeah, that's my maybe not best answer to a difficult question, but I think these are like, the, this is like the crux of, of the sort of um, planning, planning debate um, in general. Chris Walters. Danny. Anna from the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, we sincerely, sincerely thank you for taking the time today and bringing the social aspect to planning. Um, great presentation. So pleased to have you today. Um, I also want to offer thanks to District Manager Sean Campbell, who is the innovator of the series. Um, thank you to Anya Hoyer and Brian Williams um, from the district office, office support, to um, also make this, um, this series happen. Uh, thank you for all the attendees. Uh, again, the, if you've missed any of the episodes, you can find them on our YouTube channel. Um, we look forward to seeing you next week. Um, we have our fifth uh, presentation on June 10th, uh, the, also a Thursday, also between one and two. All right. Thank you That's all. That's it for me. Um, thank you, here, and uh, I hope everybody has a great day. Thanks for joining us for lunch. Thanks very much, Chris. Thanks, everybody. Of course, my pleasure. Take care, all.